Thanks for tuning in to another episode of the Forgotten Hockey Players of Broadway. A nostalgic look back at our favorite Rangers from the 60s, 70s, and 80s. I'm Tom Browning, along with my co-host Rob Berger. We can be heard on Google Play, iHeartRadio, YouTube, iTunes, Spotify, and of course, our website at GoTommyBoyProductions.Lipson.com. That's GoTommyBoyProductions.Lipson, L-I-B-S-Y-N.com. Please check it out. You can capture all of our episodes on our webpage. You can contact us by just clicking on the contact bar. You can leave a message. We'd love to hear from you. Love to hear about the players that you would like for us to profile. Love to hear about maybe some of the seasons other than the 60s, 70s, and 80s that really made an impact on you as a fan. Again, we will be going off the menu every once in a while. We'll be talking about the current day New York Rangers, the state of the franchise. And again, we love to talk about previous playoff games, impactful trades that took place in New York Rangers history. So wherever you listen to us, please hit subscribe. It's free. So without further ado, here are your hosts, Tom Browning and Rob Berger. Thanks for tuning in and welcome to another episode of the Forgotten Hockey Players of Broadway. I'm Tom Browning. My co-host, Rob Berger, is on vacation this week, being President's Week. So today I want to uh, discuss a very exciting Center Reisman, who played for the New York Rangers during the 1980s. He wore two numbers with the Rangers, number 24 and number 10, Lucky Pierre LaRouche. But before I get to LaRouche, I just want to touch on uh, some of the goings-ons with the New York Rangers right now. Uh, They are riding the hot hand of uh, Igor Shesterkin, their rookie goaltender, as well as uh, Alexander Georgiev, who continues to play very, very well, plays very consistently, and right now, between Georgiev and Shesterkin, the Rangers have themselves a quite a dynamic, young, one-two punch in goal. A tandem in goal that could last for the next five, ten years or so, uh, provided that both of these folks, uh, both of these young men, uh, stick with the team and do, do not get moved in any sort of uh, transaction between now and the end of the year. I like the way David Quinn has stuck with the two young guns. Uh, Looks like Henrik Lundqvist. A decision regarding Lundqvist will probably be made sooner rather than later. Uh, Right now, he's been basically uh, taking up room at the end of the bench. Uh, As a matter of fact, I do not believe he even dressed for the last game against the Blackhawks. And I think it's a smart move. It's a move that I've been railing about for the last couple of years. It's a move that should have been done several years ago. Uh, the eye test, you know, you can look at stats all you want, but the eye test, any knowledgeable hockey fan, you take a look through your own eyes, through your own experience watching goaltenders in the National Hockey League, and it was evident that Lundquist has lost uh, quite a bit on his fastball over the past several years. And this move had to be made. And it's really a lesson, I think, regarding these long-term contracts. And it's also a lesson about, you know, just being very sentimental when it comes to a player that has provided, you know, some good years for your hockey club or any sports organization for that matter. But when it comes to winning championships, you really have to leave sentimentality. You have to push that to the side. And even though Lundqvist has been a good player for the New York Rangers, people who've been following the broadcast know that I really feel that in the clutch, he was no more than just a a good goaltender. He never established himself, to me, as an elite goaltender, a clutch goaltender, especially in the playoffs. And I think with these two young guys, Shesterkin and Georgiev, I think they are set up now, the New York Rangers are, for having one of the best young tandems, goaltending tandems in the National Hockey League. The team itself has been playing very, very well. I think David Quinn has really uh, gotten this team to gel. They have the youngest team in the National Hockey League. And with the trading deadline coming up, it's going to be very interesting for Jeff Gordon and David Quinn to really, you know, not get sucked into the allure of the playoffs right now. Because right now, the way this team is is constituted, with all the development that the Rangers, this young club, has yet to achieve 
to me, there would be no more than a one-and-done team in the playoffs. And are you willing to risk that by not making tough decisions, moving some of the veteran players for additional young pieces, draft picks that can translate into better long-term contributors going down the road? Can you get seduced by the playoffs? Will they be seduced by the opportunity to make the playoffs losing out early in the playoffs in the first or second round and losing an opportunity to make your club stronger in the future and to develop a bona fide, consistent championship caliber club, a Stanley Cup caliber championship club year in and year out. And that's a decision that Jeff Gordon and David Quinn have to make along with the rest of the New York Rangers brass. And to me, I think it's important that you move some of these veteran players, you know, is it possible to move a Mark Stahl? Probably not with that contract. But Chris Kreider, who's having a great year this year, is definitely somebody that can bring back quite a bit in the way of return for the New York Rangers. Now, a lot of fans will argue, well, you know, why would you want to move a Chris Kreider? Well, where was Chris Kreider? Where was this Chris Kreider the last five or six years? You know, he is not a kid anymore. He's 28, I believe he'll be 29 fairly soon. The guy has always had a tremendous amount of physical talent, but he has disappeared. He has disappeared for games at a time. He has disappeared within games. He has not been the model of consistency. And what happens if the Rangers sign him to a five, six, seven-year contract for $7 million a year? I mean, he's going to be 35, 36, 37 years old possibly by the end of his tenure with the New York Rangers if he signs his contract. And what happens if next year he becomes the – The player he's been the last four or five years, his non-contract years, inconsistency, where he disappears at long periods of time. What is that going to get the New York Rangers in their quest for a Stanley Cup? So I think Kreider has to be moved. And then you got some other players, you know, Jesper Faust, who I think could be a very attractive talent for Stanley Cup contending teams, especially in the playoffs where defense is paramount. There isn't a lot of time and space. You want a tough, hard-nosed, hard-working player like Jesper Faust. I don't know if the Rangers have the luxury with all the young talent they have in the minor leagues, the kids they're going to be drafting this year and next, that if Jesper Faust can take up a roster spot, he probably, probably would be better suited to be moved to a Stanley Cup contending team where he has a chance to win a Stanley Cup, a veteran presence, than he would be playing for the New York Rangers. What happens to Ryan Strom, one of my favorite players? I think he has gelled terrifically with Panarin this year, and I think Panarin would miss Ryan Strom. I think Ryan Strom is now the player the New York Islanders thought they drafted six, seven years ago in the first round, and he's only 26 years old. I would like to keep Ryan Strom. You know, center icemen are not easy. Productive center icemen are not easy to find. He's a hard-nosed guy. He plays physically like uh, most New York Islander uh, draft picks do. And I think he brings that physicality that David Quinn really likes. I would keep Ryan Strom if at all possible, unless the Rangers are totally blown away by a terrific deal. And there's a few other guys, you know, that could be in play. How about Truba? I mean, could it be that the Rangers made a mistake with this guy? Uh, He has been nothing more than average, I think, most of the season. Yeah, he logs a lot of minutes, but is he worth the $9 million that the Rangers paid? Was he worth Neil Pionk, who's had a very, very strong year with the Winnipeg Jets? Could uh, Truba be an attractive piece? Could he be somebody that uh, will pay a lot for, pay up in the way of assets, young talent, maybe roster players? You know, could it be a situation where um, Jeff Gordon is um, given an offer that he can't refuse for a Truba? So... You know, that's another guy that, you know, probably won't be moved. But maybe, you know, a Stanley Cup contending team might feel that they are a uh, Jason Truba away from from uh, getting to the next level in their quest for a Stanley Cup championship. And there's a few other Ranger players. You know, Tony D'Angelo. I would not move him. When was the last time Tony D'Angelo? Or when was the last time the Rangers had an offensive talent like Tony D'Angelo on defense? I mean... You know, the Rangers' defense core over the years has not been the most prolific, you know, offensive group in the National Hockey League. And you got a guy that could run the power play, 
He's very dangerous offensively, five on five. So, again, those types of talents do not grow on trees. And David Quinn, you know, I think he's done a great job. You know, David Quinn has, has brought the best out of guys that have struggled in their National Hockey League career. Ryan Strom and Tony D'Angelo, just to name two guys. How about Kreider? You know, I mean, you have to give Quinn credit for getting Kreider to play consistently uh, the entire season. So, again, I think the Rangers are in a good good place right now. I think they've got an excellent head coach. He brings that Boston Bruin mentality to uh, the club. He loves physicality. And everybody knows, if you, if you follow the National Hockey League, it's the physical teams that win the Stanley Cups. When the Penguins won their Stanley Cups, they were loaded with offensive talent and physicality. The Washington Capitals, loaded with offensive talent and physicality. You know, the same for the other clubs. The L.A. Kings, big, heavy, strong teams. And, you know, you can have your figure skaters out there. You can have your offensive elite players, your skilled players. But the guys who win the Stanley Cups, the guys who bring championships to the respective Stanley Cup organizations, are the ones that don't get a lot of fanfare. They're the ones that create the time and space for the elite talents to score goals in the Stanley Cup. And I think David Quinn and Jeff Gordon, who comes from the Bruins organization, I think they're on track. And uh, the move they made this week in getting rid of uh, Joey Keane, who I really liked, for this kid, uh, Gauthier, from the Carolina Hurricanes. Big kid, 6'4", 220 pounds. I think uh, he will fit in very well with the way David Quinn wants to build this team. So it'll be interesting. The trade deadline is Monday. Uh, Rob and I will talk about you know, the results of that trade deadline during our March broadcast. It's going to be very interesting. We're two games away from the trade deadline. And it'll be interesting to see, do the Rangers bench or not dress Chris Kreider? Do they not bench Ryan Strom? Do they they not dress Ryan Strom? Uh, How about Lundquist? Is there any chance, any chance that he waives his no trade contract and gets moved before the trade deadline? Wouldn't that be a blockbuster? Wouldn't that be something? Or at the end of the year, do the Rangers um, eat his salary? Do they buy him out? And um, move on from Lundqvist after this season. Move him to the front office or let him go and uh, make his own deal with another club somewhere else in the National Hockey League. So that is another interesting thing that has been rumored or has been talked about or whispered about, I I should say. We don't know what Henrik is uh, thinking right now. Uh, It'll be interesting to see how this all unfolds. And if the Rangers do make moves, can they still sustain this hot pace, even without some of their more veteran players? Can the kids step up the last several weeks of the season and catapult this team into uh, the playoffs? Do the Rangers give kids in the minor leagues an opportunity once these veterans are moved to establish themselves as bona fide National Hockey League uh, players? So that remains to be seen for the rest of the year. But right now I want to get into our featured player, And he was one of my favorite Rangers during the 1980s. He was definitely one of the most skilled Rangers to ever wear the uniform. And again, he really fits the profile of uh, the forgotten hockey players of Broadway. And it's amazing that this gentleman does not get more notice today. When fans look back at some of the players that that wore the, the Rangers uniform, the elite players that wore the Rangers uniform in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, that this name doesn't come up more often, and that is number 24 and number 10, who are both numbers with the New York Rangers, Lucky Pierre LaRouche, a charismatic athlete, a fun-loving guy, uh, a real positive in the locker room, always had a smile on his face, always enjoyed coming to the rink, playing the game the right way. And while he wasn't the most proficient defensively, when you got a a center ice talent, an offensive talent like Pierre LaRouche, you can, you know, you can look the other way sometimes when it comes to his defense. You know, as Phil Esposito said when he was the GM of the Rangers back in the 80s, when you got a guy that can fill the net like Pierre LaRouche, you don't worry too much about, and I'm paraphrasing, you don't worry too much about the defense. So just to review Pierre's career, uh, he was drafted eighth overall by the Pittsburgh Penguins in the 1974 NHL Amateur Draft. He has set all sorts of records in junior hockey. As a matter of fact, in his junior hockey league days, he set records for goals and points 
that was surpassed only by Mario Lemieux. As a matter of fact, um, Pierre had 251 points in 1973-1974. Uh, just an incredible amount of points. I think about that. 251 points <laughs> during the 73-74 season, which was uh, surpassed only by Mario Lemieux with 282 points during the 83 and 84 season. And of course, uh, Mario Lemieux went on to become uh, LaRouche's boss in the 90s. And I believe Pierre LaRouche is still with the Pittsburgh Penguins today, but I believe LaRouche joined the Penguins organization in the front office during the 1990s when uh, Mario Lemieux was running the organization. And of course, Lemieux still has a big uh, role in it today. Pierre LaRouche was a prolific goal scorer in the Quebec Junior Hockey League. And, you know, LaRouche's uh, prolific goal scoring in the Quebec Major Junior Hockey League translated immediately to the National Hockey League and his rookie year with the Pittsburgh Penguins. Matter of fact, he became an instant star, a National Hockey League star, his rookie year with the Penguins. Uh, LaRouche scored 31 goals as a rookie, and he became the Penguins' first 50-goal scorer with 53 goals in 1975-76. And when people think back to the Penguins back in the 80s and 90s when they won their first couple Stanley Cups with Yager and Lemieux and those guys, you know, people forget that it was it was uh, Pierre LaRouche who be, was the first Pittsburgh Penguin player to score uh, 50 goals. And again, he scored 53 in 1975-76. And that was the first of two 50-goal seasons for LaRouche, who in 1979-1980... Uh, became the first NHL player to score 50 uh, goals for two different teams when he scored 50 for Montreal. And people forget or don't realize that he holds the Mon- he held the Montreal Canadiens record at the time as the first Montreal Canadiens center to score 50 goals in a season. Now, when you think back of the great Montreal Canadian teams with center Iceman, with uh, Jean Beliveau and uh, Richard, I mean... It's amazing that Pierre LaRouche, with that storied history, was the first Montreal Canadian center to score 50 goals in a season. And he was he made quite an impact with the Canadians. You know, he helped lead the Canadians to two Stanley Cup championships during the late 1970s. Uh, so, you know, Pierre LaRouche not only made an impact with the Rangers during the 80s, but he made a huge impact with the Pittsburgh Penguins during the uh, – middle uh, part of the 1970s and also with the Montreal Canadiens winning two Stanley Cups in the late 1970s. And after uh, four seasons with Montreal, he played four seasons with Pittsburgh. And then after four seasons with Montreal, uh, he played for the Hartford Whalers. An injury played two seasons with the Hartford Whalers. He had 22 games his first year with Hartford, 25 games, I'm sorry, 22 games his first year, 45 games his second year. He did score 25 goals his second year with the Hartford Whalers in only 45 games. So that's quite an achievement. And then uh, due to his history, uh, injury history, uh, the Rangers, uh, he left uh, the Hartford Whalers. The New York Rangers signed him as a free agent right before the 1983-84 season. And he uh, started his Ranger career with a vengeance. Uh, He had 48 goals his first season with the Rangers, followed by goals, uh, 24 goals, 20 and 28, the following three seasons, making him one of the Rangers' all-time leading scorers in the decade of the 1980s. So this is a guy that still holds the New York Rangers' record for center Iceman, goals scored by a center Iceman today with 48. That's quite an accomplishment when you think of uh, all the great center Icemen that played for the New York Rangers, like Jean Rattel, Esposito played for the Rangers, of course, as a center Iceman. You had Mike Rogers. You know, you had some very prolific, Mark Messier. You know, you had some very prolific, outstanding center Icemen that played for the Rangers. And LaRouche still holds that uh, center ice record for goals in a season with 48 that he tallied during the 1983-84 season. And with that 48-goal season with the New York Rangers, he also became the first player to score over 40 goals with three separate teams. I'm not sure if that record is still maintained today with all the high uh, goal scoring that is so prolific in the National Hockey League today. But at the time, the first player in NHL history to score 40 goals with three different teams now, unfortunately, injuries marred Pierre LaRouche's career. And, you know, he scored 395 goals 
in the National Hockey League. But if he didn't have the injuries that he faced during his career, he easily would have had over 500 goals. And I, for the life of me, I can't figure out why Pierre LaRouche is not a Hall of Fame player right now. He was also a very, very good playoff goal scorer. As a matter of fact, during that magical run back in 1986 playoffs, when the Rangers unexpectedly went to the third round of the Stanley Cup playoffs, he led the team that year in playoff points with 17 points in 16 games. And his eight goals that particular playoff season uh, tied a former team record for playoff goals in one season. And then again, injuries really curtailed uh, the rest of his career, and he had to retire at the age of 32 due to a uh, a real uh, problem with his back. And finally, I would be remiss in not mentioning that uh, LaRouche earned all-star team recognition uh, during that great 1984 season uh, with the New York Rangers. And finally, there's a couple other records worth noting. And again, this is... These are records that are really incredible to behold. Pierre LaRouche, during his day, was the youngest player in National Hockey League history to reach 50 goals, 100 goals, and 200 points. And he accomplished all this by the age of 21, only for this record to be shattered by, guess who, Wayne Gretzky. And then he was also the youngest player to reach 300 points and that record was broken by the great Brian Trottier when Brian Trottier was 22 years old, recording uh, 300 points in his career. Uh, so to end the career with 395 goals, 427 assists, for 822 points in 812 games, over a point per game, is quite a feat. And again, not a Hall of Famer. Now, when LaRouche retired, he became, became quite the golfer. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, he was a winning player on the Celebrity Player Tour, and he near, nearly qualified for the U.S. Open in 1993. So, Pierre LaRouche was an outstanding athlete, a great golfer uh, once he retired. And he also, from a personal standpoint, he dedicates a lot of his time to different charities. And he's he's got... Uh, quite a bit of involvement in a lot of cancer uh, charities, uh, and I believe it's in the Pittsburgh area. So, you know, Pierre LaRouche was uh, quite, a, quite a guy, quite a character. Again, that 1986 New York Ranger playoff run where they went to the third round of the Stanley Cup, and he had played half the year in the minor leagues with Hershey, came back with the Rangers with the vengeance, scoring 20 goals in 28 games leading up to the Stanley Cup uh, playoffs. And that team, on a miracle run, going deep into the playoffs, three rounds, LaRouche contributing in 16 playoff games, 17 points, including eight goals. Uh, I think that's probably the the biggest, the, the best season or the season that New York Ranger fans will probably look most um, fondly, as well as that 48-goal season that he had his uh, first year with the New York Rangers being signed as a free agent. So, again, that is a wrap-up on a profile on Lucky Pierre, Pierre LaRouche, number 10 and number 24. Rob and I would really appreciate any of your ideas, suggestions for our podcast. Contact our webpage. Hopefully in March we'll be able to look back at some big moves that the Rangers uh, made to strengthen their team for the future. And we will touch on another player from the 1960s, 70s, or 80s. So on behalf of Rob Berger, this is Tom Browning signing off for the Forgotten Hockey Players of Broadway. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for listening. This has been a Go Tommy Boy production. 